How's it, how's it, how's it, how's it? I hope you guys are doing well today. And just before we get into today's message, I just want to share this important reminder because this might mean that some of you are not going to be watching the rest of this video. We are meeting in person this evening, Sunday, 4.30 p.m. at 48 Gordon Road at the Trinity Church Morningside venue. It's our first in-person gathering for the whole year, which is crazy, but we're really looking forward to being together. Now listen, uh, this is pre-recorded. This has been recorded on Friday, so registrations could be full by now, but you can check online, uh, look through either the link in one of our social media bios or the link through our weekly email update, and you can register there if there are any places left otherwise you'll be able next week to register early on in the week and guarantee you get one of the seats but we're really excited to be gathering again in person if you're unable to gather with us we're going to continue to put out this church at home content for the next little while but I'd really encourage you if you're healthy if you're able come and be with us in person I think most people are just saying that they've missed worshiping in person being with one another being with the church Um, So we're excited that we're able to do that again. But before we jump into today's message, let's take a moment just to pray and ask God to speak to us. So Father, just as we do sit and enjoy church at home and listen to this message, I pray right now for you to speak to each person. I pray specifically, personally, intimately, you would meet with them. Holy Spirit, be with them. Lead them, guide them, convict them, encourage them. I pray, meet each person where they're at. And as we are in this Jesus Encounter series, I pray that they would encounter the real Jesus, the living Jesus, right now, in your name. Amen. Well, this is week two of our Jesus Encounters series. And as we get into today's message, I just want to ask you if you've ever been skeptical about someone or something and why. What about them? What about this thing or the situation made you feel skeptical? So I know for me, sometimes I meet someone and I go, ah, they seem a little bit too good to be true. Or they're saying all the right things, but they maybe seem a little bit slimy or like something is off. Or I don't know if you're the same as me, if we're wired the same. But sometimes if everyone is raving about something or someone, I think to myself, "Hmm, I'm going to have to meet them for myself. I'm going to have to go and see for myself if this is all that it's cracked up to me. So I don't know if you're skeptical at all. I know I can be a bit of a skeptic. I was definitely that way with church. Um, I know for me, I've had moments of doubt and questions over the years with Jesus and Christianity. But maybe even more so, I think I've been skeptical of church at times. And I think maybe that feels like a crazy confession for a pastor to make. But I remember particularly as a 17-year-old going to a church that I'd never been to in Pinetown before. I went and visited one Sunday and I was skeptical of everything I saw. I was skeptical of the guy up front preaching. I was skeptical of everyone hugging each other. It was weird to me. It was new to me. I was skeptical of people saying I love you to their friends so easily. I was even skeptical of the people after a couple of weeks who were inviting me for coffee or to their place or to do something after the service. I was wondering what the angle was and why they were trying to spend time with me. And today I am one of those people. I'm a hugger. I'm a I love you person. I'm a let's do something together kind of person. And maybe you're a bit skeptical of me as the preacher or some of the things that you've seen at Harvest City before. But I was skeptical of that church, not knowing that over the next 13 years of my life, I would be completely and radically transformed being among those people as we sought Jesus together. Now, I think skepticism is something that's quite um, common when it comes to Jesus encounters. And you might be feeling skeptical right now, watching this, skeptical of Christianity or Jesus or the church or me or something else. But one of the things that I love about the Bible, as I'm getting to know it more and more, is that the Bible is not afraid of our questions or doubts or fears or concerns. The Bible is actually really real and honest and speaks to human realities and questions and feelings and uncertainties and the responses that we have to things. And and we'll see that today as we're in John chapter 1, looking at this interesting Jesus encounter between Jesus and a skeptic. We'll we'll read together from verse 43. The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. He found Philip and told him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and so did the prophets, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. 
Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathanael asked him. Come and see, Peter or Philip answered. Then Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you, Jesus answered. Rabbi, Nathanael replied, You are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus responded to him, Do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. Then he said, Truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now to set the context for this Jesus encounter, I just want to say up front that John chapter 1 is a chapter chock full of Jesus encounters. It starts up front with John the Apostle, the disciple Jesus loved, writing about Jesus and setting the tone for this whole gospel, this whole biography of Jesus' life. And then we go into another John, John the Baptizer, actually one of Jesus' relatives, someone called by God to prepare the way for the Lord, who points us to Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then we're introduced to Peter and to Andrew and to Philip, three guys, who, along with Nathaniel, will become apostles and leaders in this Jesus movement, which is going to sweep the world. And lastly, we meet this Nathaniel. And in John 1, we see just Jesus encounter after Jesus encounter, where we see person introducing someone else to Jesus, pointing people to Jesus. And really, the reason I want to encourage you to get into this chapter for yourself after the service today is read it through, think it through, slowly go through it and pray it through. Because this chapter is just showing us again and again who Jesus is, what he is all about. But let's start in John 1 verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. He found Philip and told him, follow me. Now, what we see in John 1 and in a lot of the Jesus encounters you'll read in the scriptures is that having a spiritual experience, whatever that means, with Jesus is not enough. When we encounter Jesus, we must respond to him too. And that response is always some kind of version of following him. So when Jesus encounters Philip, he says, follow me here. He doesn't say, hey, pray a prayer and then you'll be all good. You'll be saved and you can carry on with your life. He doesn't say, just invite me into your heart and then go on your merry way. He doesn't say, do religious duties if you're really serious about this. Instead, he says, begin a new life with me, following me. It's not just have a Jesus encounter and carry on your life. No, it's encounter Jesus and let him change the trajectory of your life. Be with him for the rest of your life. Now for Philip, responding to this call of Jesus meant literally following him physically. It meant quitting his job. It meant going from town to town. It meant saying goodbye to his family. It meant kind of locking up his home and making sure someone was feeding his pets. It meant all of that. When you decide to follow Jesus, it might look a little bit different. It might not mean that you have to get out on the road or move geographically or say goodbye to anyone or even do anything except for changing the posture and attitude of your heart. Really, the big idea here is that when we encounter Jesus and choose to follow him, we're saying that our life has a new leader. Our life has a new king. And that, yes, we are ready at the drop of a hat to do anything that he would ask us to do anywhere, anytime, because we're following him. And the right response to Jesus we see in the Gospels is worshipful obedience because Jesus is our King. So Philip begins to follow Jesus and he's excited about this. He's excited to have met Jesus, to have heard his teaching, to be part of this Jesus movement. And he sees his buddy Nathaniel and he says, hey Nate, come and join us. We've met Jesus the Messiah, the one Moses wrote about, the one the scriptures speak about, the one the prophets prophesied about. We've met him, we're following him. Come and meet him, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. And you know how Nathaniel replies? Very skeptically, he's been triggered by the last word there, the word Nazareth. He says, can anything good come from Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Now, if you don't know much about ancient Nazareth, Nazareth was a small town of less than 2,000 people. It's like this agricultural settlement, but really, really small and insignificant, not important at all. And it was the kind of place that if it was in KZN, wouldn't even make it onto the Midlands Meander. 
So when Phil tells Nate that Jesus is the Messiah who all of the Israelites have been waiting for, the, the Savior of the nation, the one come sent by God, and he hears that he's from Nazareth, Nathaniel laughs in his face. There's no ways that Nathaniel is going to follow someone from Nazareth. There's no ways Nathaniel is going to bow his knee and worship Jesus from Nazareth as king. Nazareth was a bad neighborhood where no one wanted to live. It was an insignificant area that no one would brag about coming from. And of course, if you really were going to meet the Messiah, the Savior of the world, you would expect him to come from an important place, not from a nowhere place like Nazareth. Now, my wife, Michelle, who some of you know, grew up in a Nazareth. It's a town in a dodgy area in the UK called Blackpool. And whenever someone asks her where she comes from, particularly someone who knows the UK or is from the UK, I see she'll do this little strategic dance. And she starts and says, oh, I come from the north of England. And some people, that's enough. And they go, okay, and they move on. But for people that know England and the north of England, they'll say, oh, which part? And then she'll strategically again says, I come from the northwest. And for those who really want to know, they'll say, whereabouts in the northwest? And she'll say, near Manchester, because... You know, if you hear Manchester, you think Manchester United, you think it must be good. And sometimes people say, oh, we're near Manchester. And Shell has to divulge that she grew up in Blackpool. And if they know the area, when they hear Blackpool, they go, oh, oh I, I've heard of Blackpool before. I've never been there, but I've heard of it before. And there's, you know, they don't say, oh, shame. But there's almost like that negative connotation associated with the whole thing. And yeah, I guess Shell tries to hide that. I'm publicly sharing her shame about this, her hidden shame, airing her dirty laundry. But at least I can tell you something good came out of Blackpool. Shell is amazing. But prejudice like this, prejudice against a neighborhood like Nazareth or Blackpool can come in many different shapes and sizes. I grew up in Kloof and Durban North, two fairly affluent areas in Durban, if you know our city fairly well. And when I tell some people that, some people go, oh, cool, you know, it's, it's not a thing at all. But some people have been interesting. When they've asked me where I'm from, and I say Durban North, Kloof, all of that, they've judged me. And whether they say this explicitly or it's just implicit, they go, oh, so you grew up rich. So you're a snob. Say no more. By where you've grown up, I know what kind of person you are. I know how to categorize you. Now, listen. There are many different types of bias and prejudice and arrogance and judgment and self-righteousness. And we see one type here with Nathaniel, where he hears that Jesus is from his Blackpool, from Nazareth. He thinks the way most of us would think. He kind of writes him off. And he believes there's no way that this man can be the Messiah. Because if God is going to do something big, if God is here to save the world, if he's sending his Messiah, if he's sending his son, there's no way he's going to come from Nazareth. You know, maybe Rome the most important city in the world, maybe Jerusalem, a significant city for the Israelite people. But there's no way he's going to come from the small middle of nowhere town like Nazareth. We South Africanize this a little bit. We might think if God's going to do something big, he's going to do it in Johannesburg. Maybe he'll do it in Cape Town, but there's no way he's going to do it down the south coast of KZN in Umbumbulu or some small town like that. But Jesus did grow up in Nazareth. Now, for someone from Rome, Jerusalem, which was a significant city for the people of God, would seem like a tiny little town, unimportant, insignificant. For someone from Jerusalem, the area of Galilee would seem like a really small, rural, middle of nowhere, hillbilly, redneck, uh, out of the way, unimportant, insignificant place. And for someone like Nathaniel, who grew up in the area of Galilee, he speaks of Nazareth, a town of Galilee, as if it is the lowest of the low, the least important, least significant, tiny town. But in some ways it is a nothing town. Nazareth was not a town that you moved to, to climb up a social ladder. You didn't go there because of its culture and opportunities. Nazareth was the tiny end of town that if you're looking for it on Google Maps, you'd have to zoom and zoom and zoom and zoom before its name even appeared on the screen. Nazareth was the kind of town that people left to get ahead. They left it for a better and more exciting life. So there would be no way that the Messiah could have grown up in Nazareth, except that he did. God's public relations, God's marketing, God's strategy, God's ways, His plans, God's way of judging and measuring success are so clearly different from our own. And we see that in this passage. But for Philip, 
or sorry, for Nathaniel, Nazareth was strike one against Jesus. He was skeptical of Nazareth. And Jesus had a bunch of strikes against his name. Maybe you do too. Jesus was born to an unmarried teenage girl who would have been disgraced and scandalized in her town for being pregnant before she was married. He was also born in a feeding trough. So when Mary gave birth to Jesus, he got put down in like this trough, this bucket where the animals ate out of. Not, not in a fancy hospital with a nice gynae and a doula and some kind of birthing coach. No, he was born in a barn. Jesus grew up poor. His parents were poor, so he was poor. And he did blue collar work. You know, he worked with his hands. He worked hard. Jesus was probably really strong. But for the first 30 or so years of his life, he worked a blue collar job. He grew up in obscurity. He was unknown. He wasn't famous. And when, and when Jesus launched his ministry, he followed a similar pattern. His disciples were not the most impressive bunch of guys. They're not people you would pick for your dream team if you were Jesus. They were often fighting. They shared some terrible theological opinions. They told Jesus what to do a bunch and basically gave Jesus a lot of opportunities to coach them. None of these disciples were royalty or influential intellectuals or rich business tycoons or successful or famous sporting heroes or uh, social media influencers. You know, they were ordinary people like you and I. And I just want you to know, like some of us put a bit of a Disney lens as we read the scriptures, but this is not a Disney sporting movie. It's not like Jesus comes along to this ragtag bunch of misfits and he's able to draw out these diamonds in the rough. You know, with a bit of coaching, with a bit of confidence, showing them the way actually what was inside of them all along could come out. No, that's not the story here. These are not superstars. These are ordinary people like us. That's Jesus' group. On top of this, Jesus' sermons and comments seem to often offend people, shrinking his group of followers down the whole time, and also leading to a couple of assassination attempts on his life. And then finally, probably the worst part of the story is that Jesus was crucified. He died the most public and shameful death as a criminal. He was declared guilty by the courts. The crowd literally bayed for his blood. They wanted him to die. They wanted to see him die. And he died as someone who would not be called a success in anyone's eyes. Jesus, at the end of his life, had 120 followers of his own. He didn't have a book. He didn't have a successful podcast. He didn't have a YouTube channel with thousands of followers or anything like that. No one subscribed to him. He just had a crowd of 120 that would become the first church plant in the city of Jerusalem. And I want to put this to you. You know, If you were launching a global gospel movement wanting to change the world with your message, is that the strategy you would implement? Well, of course not. Jesus' birth and most of Jesus' life happened in obscurity off the map of the power brokers of his day. No one would have looked at his pregnant teenage mom or the manger he was born in or the fact that he grew up in Nazareth, which really infuriated Nathaniel, or his disciples, or finally the cross. No one would have looked at all of that and said, you know what, we've got star power here. Jesus Christ, superstar, this is our guy. He's got the X factor. Let's put him on a fast track to the top. He's going to be a star. That's not what anyone would have thought. And we learn something really important about God and his ways here. We often value and prioritize the things that God doesn't value or prioritize. We think bigger. We think better. We think shinier. We think more popular, sexier, trendier, faster, more expensive, more, which is not always better. We think if you're in the right neighborhood, if you've got the right pedigree, if you've got the right degree, if you come from the right family, if you tick all of the right social boxes, then you're good. But all that glitters is not gold, to use a bit of a hackneyed 16th century saying from William Shakespeare, all that glitters is not gold. And as a pastor, just to be honest with you, I have often over the years seen people make big life-altering decisions, not because they're following Jesus, but because they're following the script of our culture. They're making these decisions to climb the social ladder. They're, they're believing the story that our culture and society tells of what the good life is. Because our society constantly tells us to prioritize all of these things that we see so clearly here in this passage are just unimportant to God. And in Christ, God takes the expectations of this world and he flips them on their head. He flips them upside down. So how do we answer Nathaniel the skeptic's question here? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, yes. Yes, Nathaniel, it can. And in a minute, you're about to see how. 
This passage is about Jesus and the skeptic and Nathaniel overcoming his skepticism as he encounters Jesus and becomes a follower. But as you hear this message today, you also need to answer this question. Is my skepticism about Jesus or is it about myself? Is my skepticism about Jesus or is it about myself? Because some of us are sitting here asking a different skeptical question, and it's this. Can anything good come out of my life? Can anything good come out of me? Can anything good come out of Durban? Can anything good come out of the situation I'm in, or my mistake, or failure, or sin? Can anything good come out of this last year, which has been so difficult for me? And what this passage tells us is that when Jesus is involved, the answer is yes. When Jesus is involved, the answer is yes. I love Philip's response to Nathaniel's skepticism. He says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? The answer is come and see. Philip doesn't try and defend Jesus, defend him as the Messiah or anything like that. What he says is, hey, come, let me introduce you to Jesus. And I'm pretty sure as you meet him, you'll see for yourself what I've seen. So Philip leads Nate to go and meet Jesus. And the introduction is so interesting. They haven't even said hello to one another yet. And Jesus looks at Nathanael and he says to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Kind of a weird first intro conversation. But Nathanael responds and says, How do you know me? And Jesus answers and says, Before Philip called you, you were under the fig tree and I saw you. Now that means nothing to me, you know. Those words don't strike me at all. You know, if Jesus was to say that to me, that would seem weird. But it means something huge for Nathaniel. I mean, when Jesus says that first thing, here is an Israelite. You know, he's true. There's no deceit in him. This is just almost like this divine moment of peeking to the core of who Nate is. And he responds and he says, how do you know me? How do you, the stranger that I've never met before, how do you know me? He feels seen and known and understood by Jesus, even though he's never met Jesus before. And I don't know what this encounter would look like for you. You know, what Jesus would have to say to you for you to say, how do you know me? For you to see, feel like Jesus has looked to the core of your being and understands you and your essence. I don't know what that would be. But for Nathaniel, Jesus hits the bullseye with those 11 words. He's able to do it. And then Jesus follows it up by saying this. When you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now again, we don't know what that means. We're never told in scripture what happened under the fig tree. Only Jesus and Nathaniel know that. It's just between them. But it feels like this, I know what you did last summer kind of vibe. Nathaniel speaks, sorry, Jesus speaks to Nathaniel and again gets to the core of him, to a key situation in his life. So we don't know what Nate was doing under that fig tree. Maybe it was bad. <laughs> Maybe he was sinning. Maybe this is the most shameful moment of his life. He, he went to this fig tree. He looked around, made sure no one was around and could see. And he did something that he was ashamed of, but that he wanted to do. And now Jesus seems to know about it, which means that Jesus must be God. Jesus saw, and he knows in that moment that Jesus saw him at his most shameful, sinful, embarrassed moment, which means Jesus knows everything about him. Jesus sees him completely as he is. He's exposed before Jesus. Maybe it wasn't that. Maybe it wasn't a bad thing. Maybe it was a good thing. Maybe it was a moment of prayer saying, God, would you reveal yourself to me? I'm hungry to know you more. Or maybe a more intense prayer. Maybe something like, God, this is your last chance. If you're real, you need to reveal yourself to me. I want to know you. If you're out there, show yourself. Otherwise, I'm going to go my own way. We don't know. It could have been that. It could have been something completely different. We'll never know the answer. All we know is that when Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree, it reveals something to Nathaniel. And he knows in that moment that Jesus really is the Messiah, even though he comes from Nazareth. I want to say to you today, Jesus knows you better than you know yourself. He knows every part of you, every part of your life. Jesus sees you. He knows your story, the good and the bad. He knows how you're wired and he knows that because he actually wired you that way. And he loves that about you. Jesus understands what you're going through. He knows your dreams and desires. He knows your struggles and your sins. He knows your prayers and your wants and your needs. And he sees you, even if no one else does. And he cares. I want to ask you if you've ever had a moment of feeling truly seen. 
Uh, I've shared about this before, but I went on a pastor's retreat at the end of last year. And in the first session, we had the guy leading the retreat, who I just noticed was really good at using people's names. Always saying, hey, Grant. You know, he, he wouldn't just say, hey, man, how are you doing? He would say, hey, Grant. Hey, hey, Grant. Hey, Callum. Hey, Janita. Hey, Mike. Hey, Eugene. Hey, uh, whoever you are watching this today. He would use names because that's who we are. That's our identity. And all of us pastors there who'd had a hard year, who were tired, who were drained, it's just the uncertainty of 2020 and all of these things, the, the knocks we had taken. He cared for us, but he asked us questions that made us feel known and seen. And he went around the, the circle of guys at the table and he said, who are you, Grant? Who are you? And he just started to ask individuals and these strong, buff, tough, healthy men were just cracking and crying because God was ministering to them. And then he asked us, when was the last time someone asked you how you were really doing? I just remember watching one guy, just tears just burst out of his eyes as he was asked that. Just repeating these questions, using their names, seeing them, seeing us, asking us, knowing us, like the spotlight of heaven being on us in that moment. And Nathaniel in this encounter with Jesus feels seen. And he responds to Jesus like this. He says, Rabbi, teacher, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. He's no longer skeptical about what Philip has been saying about this Jesus. Whatever those two comments were about, you know, the, the one where he says, how do you know me? The one about the fig tree. Whatever those were about for him, they revealed all that he needed to know about Jesus. And now Nazareth is no longer part of the equation. It's not a problem. It's not an obstacle. He's had a revelation. Jesus is God and Jesus is king. And he's going to follow him. So we look at this, I think John 1 might be the best chapter about encounters in the Bible, at least top five. And I've already shared some of the different people who share their encounters in this chapter. But in this chapter, Jesus is also given a bunch of different titles that help us to know who he is. Jesus, in John 1, is called the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's called the Son of God. He's called Rabbi, which means teacher. He's called Messiah, King of Israel, Jesus of Nazareth, and Son of Man. And some of these titles are Old Testament prophetic terms speaking about the one that God would send to save his people. But there's one last revelation of who Jesus is that I want to end on today. It's the last two verses. Jesus responded to him, Do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. Then he said, Truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This might sound like a weird kind of comment or final statement, especially after what's just happened. But actually, Jesus is pointing back to Genesis 28 and a moment where Jacob experienced and encountered God. In it, Jacob goes to sleep in the desert. And while he's sleeping, he has this dream. And he sees this ladder that extends from heaven down to earth. And on the ladder are angels ascending and descending between heaven and earth. And at the top is God the Father himself looking down on everything. And what he's saying here as he ends this is that Jesus is the ladder to God. He is the only way to God, the way, the truth, and the life. He is the one that brings us into God's presence. And it's like Jesus ends this encounter with Nathaniel saying to him, if you want to know God, then you need to come through me. If you want a relationship with God, then it is through me. God has made the way. Jesus is the ladder. You don't have to do anything. All you need to do is come. But will you respond to me? And as we encounter Jesus in this story with Nathaniel and John 1, we learn four main things. We learn that Jesus doesn't always come to us in the way we would choose or expect. We learn that Jesus sees us and knows us completely. We learn that Jesus is the way to a relationship with God. And we learn lastly that Jesus calls us to respond to him and to follow him. And I want to leave you with that tonight and ask you to, to sit and meditate and think on that. And I want to ask you to think about this. What do you need to believe about Jesus today? And how do you need to respond to him today? Let's pray. Father, as we just end this time, I pray that each person watching this would know what you're wanting to say to them or how they need to respond. I pray, Jesus, you would help each of us to know you more, to see you more fully, to enjoy you, to love you, to worship you, to follow you. And help us to know what our next steps are in what to believe or what to do. 
As we go into this new week, Lord, I pray you would guide us and show us your way. In Jesus' name, amen.